In this lecture, I want to talk about extreme values, uh, what they are and how we find them and why we're even talking about them in a calculus class. So let me begin by just drawing a graph of a function, um, maybe something that kind of goes like this, all right, in terms of thinking about what an extreme value is. So this, you know, this is just a downward facing parabola and all we mean by an extreme value um, and, and actually, I should, I should be, before I talk about extreme values in more detail, we could have what are called um, relative or local extreme values or um, absolute. And these are sometimes also called global extreme values, all right? So <clears throat> a relative extreme value is just a point. So let me, I'll give you an example here. Here's a relative extreme value. Um, what it means, so this would be a relative maximum. If I move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, the function values are less than the function value right at that point. So if we call this maybe x equals a, for example, um, then we would say that f of a is a relative max or a local max, all right? Um, so that's an example of, a, of what we mean by a relative maximum or minimum. In terms of absolute, it's not just in, in so we'll, it's relative or local because it's kind of just in this area, right? Just in this area is the largest value of the function. But there might be, you know, the function in other areas, not in this particular case, but you know, you, you can imagine a function that goes on and kind of goes up higher over here. So, you know, if that were to happen, then this would only be a relative. It wouldn't be the absolute or the global extreme value or the global max because there might be another place in the function where the function takes on a larger value than what we have right here. So, um, you know, one thing that you know, hopefully makes sense is if it's an absolute extreme value, then it's also a relative um, extreme value. But now let's taking a further look at this. Let's so we have this. You know, at x equals we have a max. It's a relative max, and in this case, it's actually also um, an absolute or a global max because if this is a parabola, then this is going to be the highest point of anywhere on the parabola. So that will be at x equals a. And f of a is that max value. That's the, that's the maximum value. You know, whatever, this is the x value, and whatever this would be, you know, depending on what f is, that would be our maximum value. What about a minimum? Does this have a minimum? Well, um, it actually doesn't, because no matter, I mean, these are, this is from here, it goes down, from this side it goes down, and it just keeps decreasing. It gets smaller, it, go, it goes to negative infinity. So no matter what point you might say there is a minimum, I can find a point that would give me a smaller value than that. So no matter what value you, you, know, you found on the x-axis and, and that gives you a really small y value, I could go out a little bit farther because this is a decreasing function and find an even smaller value. So in this case, there is no minimum. All right, so that's one of the first things to recognize is it is possible for there to be no relative or global max or min. You know, so if we were to flip this over, you know, we you know, have just something like this, right? Then, then we would have a minimum and no maximum, all right? So that's one thing. And this is now just kind of looking at the entire function. Um, but we can also restrict the, the point that we're looking at. So let's take a look at our function again down here. Um, so our original function, let's let it go through the origin and kind of come up and come back down again. All right, so let's just say this is, I don't know, four, okay? Um, and we'll let this be, you know, right here, this will be one, here's our point A, this is F of A, this is our maximum. And if we say somewhere between on the, on the interval one to four, what is 
the max and the min. Well, we already know the max. If you're just looking at this, we can see this is still the max. But what's going on at, at 1 and 4? Do we have a minimum at either of those places if we kind of just kind of cut off our function right at that point? Well, it depends. Depends on whether or not we have an open interval 1 to 4. And that means it doesn't include the endpoints, right? So we would have an open circle here and an open circle here. So, you know, just looking at this, it seems if we're going to have a minimum value, it's going to be at 4. So let's think about what the minimum value would be. So we can't say it's f of 4 because we're not including 4 in our interval. So, so on this interval, f of 4 does not exist. All right. Um, so maybe we want to say that f of 3.9 is our minimum value. Um, but because this is a decreasing function, the closer I get to 4, the smaller the, the function values will be. So that will actually be bigger than f of 3.99. So maybe that's our minimum value. But again, I can get closer to 4. Um, I could t take f of 3.999 and we could keep going as long as you like. We can just keep on adding decimal places here. So the point is, we still don't have a minimum on an open interval because we can always get closer and closer without actually reaching that point. Um, so, and then likewise, we could do the same thing at 1, although it's pretty clear just from the graph that 1 is going to be neither a max nor a min. So what we would need is closed interval, right? So on the closed interval, then we could just say f of 4 is our minimum, right? We can just include that point. We know that's the lowest point. Um, if we go any past 4, we're no longer on the interval. So we just take that end point. So one way to guarantee that we have an absolute max or min is to look on a closed interval. If we have, if we're on a closed interval, then we may have uh, an absolute max or a min. Notice that this would work even if I just had a line, right? Like I could just put in a line like this. And if I, you know, include a couple points, then if I include this, I don't know, let's just call this maybe negative 1 to negative 5. Well, even though this doesn't have any kind of nice little rounding off points, I could just take f of negative 5, that would be my maximum. f of negative 1, that would be my minimum. So if we have this closed interval, so that's important, then, then the max or min could occur at, could occur at, at one of the endpoints. All right. Notice here's an example where, well, actually right here, the maximum occurred on the interior of the interval, but the minimum occurred. So when I, I should, should note here that the graph is, changes when I have a closed interval. I include this point, and I include this point. So the min or the max could, um, could occur at one of the endpoints. So the question is, is that enough to guarantee that we have a max or a min? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. So let's look at a counterexample. Let's look at um, absolute value of x, except I'm going to have this removable discontinuity right at the origin. Okay. So in this case, there is, um, so we'll call this absolute value of x, but we're going to exclude the point x equals 0. So we have a, a removable discontinuity down here. So there is no maximum. That's, and this actually behaves a lot like the parabola in that way. We can just keep, we can get larger and larger values by taking larger and larger values of x or smaller and smaller values of x. Um, so there is no maximum. What about a minimum? All right, well, it looks like if there was going to be a minimum, it would be at 0. But of course, f of 0 is undefined because I've ex excluded precisely that point from our domain. So again, we have this situation where, OK, well, maybe then f of 0.1, could that be our minimum? 
But again, this is a decreasing function, so that has to be greater than f of 0 0.001, which is greater than f of 0 0.001, and so on. So we can, we can kind of go back and play the same game we were playing before and see that no matter how close I get to this, this point here where the minimum would be, I never actually get there. I can always get a little bit closer. That will always give me a value that's a little bit smaller because this is a decreasing function. I could do the same thing from the other side, right? I could take um, negative 0.1, which would be greater than negative 0 0.01, and so on. All right, so what if I fill that in, though? If I fill that in and I kind of get rid of this condition, then I would have a minimum at x equals 0 right um, and it would be f of zero which in this case would be zero so we would have a minimum right at that point um, so let's put these two things together notice the issue here was I had a discontinuity and the discontinuity acted very similar to an open interval we could get closer and closer to it and get smaller and smaller values without ever never, without without ever reaching a minimum value so the two conditions so this is basically called the extreme value theorem and it says that, that a function f has an absolute max and minimum on a closed interval a, b, if f is continuous. So I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but the idea is you need these two things. One, you need a closed interval. Closed meaning it includes the endpoints. All right. And then two, F has to be continuous. All right. So we don't have this situation up here that we were just uh, looking at. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what... Uh, an absolute max and min are. Let's look at how we might find them or where we might look for them. So, so far what we've seen really is just that, you know, we, we have this kind of, these endpoints, and we have these points in the middle here, right? Um, this would be a minimum here. You know, so what do we notice about those points, about the tangent lines, all right? So what I want to do is define something called a critical point, okay? So graphically, a critical point, you know, we could have a function like this, is these points where f prime of, where the, where the derivative is zero. You know, we would have another one here, all right? Notice these would give us relative, this would give us a relative max and a relative min. You know, in that local area, that's the largest, this is the smallest. Okay, sorry, those are not very easy to read. All right, um, we could also have something like the, like, um, the absolute value here. So maybe something like this. And when we have a corner point, we know that f prime of x is undefined. Right, it's not differentiable at that point. But that point could give us, you know, we could just turn it over. That could give us a min, this could give us a max. So the critical points to summarize then are the points where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is, uh, does not exist, all right? So we say that, um, that a point x equals c is a critical point if f prime of c equals zero or f prime of c does not exist. We're talking about a particular, at a particular point, so maybe I'll even change these. c is a critical point if f prime of c is zero um, or f prime of c does not exist. So the question is, you know, how do we find those points, those critical points? Because those would also be places where we might have a maximum or a minimum, all right? Um, the, the other thing I want to point out is just because f prime of c equals zero, that does not imply, let me say does not imply 
that f prime of c is a relative min or max. All right. All right, black's getting tired. Let's switch colors here. Um, so here's an example. If I let f be x cubed, all right, so here's a graph of x cubed, or a sketch at least. Um, so f prime of x equals 3x squared. So the way to find our critical points is we take the derivative and we set it equal to 0. All right. So if I divide both sides by 3, I get x squared equals 0, which only happens when x equals 0. So x equals 0 is a critical point of this function. So notice we, it, this is actually just a sketch, so it's not a great sketch. It doesn't show that actually what happens to our, you know, if I wanted to sketch in some, some tangent lines here, you know, so here would be a tangent line and you know, here would be a tangent line. And what this is saying is that right at zero, this thing flattens out just for a moment right at zero. But notice, although that's a critical point, it's not a max or a min. It kind of, it goes up, the, 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 the graph goes up, it flattens out just for a moment right at that one point and then starts to go back up again. So being a critical point doesn't guarantee we're gonna have a max or a min at that point. But it's a good place to look for them, all right? Because anytime we have something that looks like this, you know, or even if we have something like that, so these these points here, where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is non-differentiable, these are good points to look, because if if I do if it, if I do have this rounding where it goes up and comes back down again, I will have the derivative equal to zero. But having the derivative equal to zero doesn't necessarily mean that I have to turn around and come back down. I can go back up again. Okay, so let's um, let's summarize then. How, where do we look for extreme values? All right. So first, we look at the critical points. And we're looking at extreme values on a closed interval. Because those are the only one, that's the only time that we are guaranteed to have an extreme value, or an absolute, or global max or min. And the other one is at the endpoints. All right? So first we have to find the critical points. We'll know what the endpoints are. They'll be given to us. And then once we know the critical points and the endpoints, we can just put them back into the function to determine which one is the absolute max and which one is the absolute min. So I just want to give you um, an example of how we would apply this to a specific problem. So let's suppose we have the function f of x equals x squared minus 2x minus 3. Okay, so I'm going to graph it, but we need, a, we need an interval, right? So we're going to look at the interval 0, 4. We want to find the absolute max and min of this function on this interval. Um, this is a quadratic, so we know it's continuous. So it's a continuous function on a closed interval. The extreme value theorem guarantees this will have an absolute max or n min. So it's um, if we were to factor this, we'd get what x plus one and x minus three. So it's going to cross the x-axis at negative one and three. Um, so it's going to come down, come back up. All right. Now, by inspection, we can see on, on 0, 4, so here's, well, let me use another color here. Um, our interval is going to start here, and here will be 4. It's going to end here, so we kind of come up here. Um, that looks like that's going to be the maximum. This would be the other end point. That looks like that will be our minimum. All right. So this is just kind of eyeballing. And if, I always encourage you to graph it because it gives you some intuition about what's going on. But we want to know how to do this algebraically as well. Um, because then we can actually find those points specifically. What is the maximum value? What is the minimum value? All right. So to find, first, let's find our critical points. All right. So we take the derivative. Should be fairly straightforward at this point. This is going to be 2x minus 2. The first thing is to de determine whether or not there's any place where it's undefined. 
And since this is a linear function, linear functions, their domain is all real numbers. So there's no place that this is undefined. So now we set it equal to zero and solve for x. So I can add two to both sides. I get two x equals two, divide by two. So I get x equals one, all right? So that's the critical point. And then we have um, the endpoints, right? So x equals zero and x equals four. So these are the three and, you know, it looks like, so I didn't draw this very well, it looks like the, the critical point should be at 1, which would be over here. So the vertex should be right along here. So now we test. We test our critical points by just plugging them into the function. So f of 0, we have 0 squared minus 2 times 0 minus 3, so that equals negative 3. f of 1, I'm just going to kind of do them in sequence from here, here, and then here. So f of 1, that gives me 1 minus 2 minus 3 so it looks like that's going to be negative 4 and then f of 4 that's going to be 16 minus 8 minus 3 or 5 so this one looks like the absolute min this one looks like the absolute max okay let's just do another example just one more example um, I'm going to look at the function uh, x minus 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. All right, so this one, this time I'm not going to graph it. You could graph this if you wanted to, and you could gain some intuition. Um, you know, a quick sketch is that it's going to look something like this, all right, uh, called the, the seagull graph. Um, but let's, let's look at how we would apply the same routine here. We find the critical points. Look at the endpoints. Oh, haven't given any endpoints yet, so that we're looking at this on the interval 0, to five. Um, this actually is a continuous function. It's a rational, well, a, a root function. Um, so it's continuous, it's on a closed interval, so we know it's gonna have an absolute max and an absolute min. So the first thing is to find the critical point. So we take the derivative, and so here we're gonna get two thirds times x minus one to the negative one third. Um, the constant goes away. Uh, now, using the chain rule, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, but that's just 1, right? The derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. So, this, and this is where a lot of students will get hung up, or they'll, they'll get, you know, they'll, they'll kind of get caught here, because your, your initial tendency is to set this equal to 0, right? That's what we want to do when we set it equal to 0, and we solve, and, and forget that what this means right here, that I have this negative, that really what I'm looking at is 2 thirds times 1 over x minus 1 to the 1 third. All right? Um, you can, we just take our derivative, we make that negative, and forget that actually this is what it means. Right? So if I were to multiply this through, I would end up with 2 over 3 times x minus 1 to the 1 third. And if you set that equal to zero, you see it can never equal zero because the only way a fraction equals zero or a rational function is if the numerator equals zero. And the numerator is a constant. Two is never equal to zero, so this will never equal zero. However, and this is why I try to encourage this, I want you first to think about if there's a place where this function is undefined. Before you worry about setting it equal to zero, ask yourself, is there a place where this function is undefined? So because this is a rational function and you have this in the denominator, the question is, can we put something in for x that would make the whole thing undefined? Another way to ask that is, can we put in something for x that would make the denominator 0? And I think you can just see from the x minus 1 here, if you let x equal 1, then we would have 0, right? The 0 to the 1 third, the cube root of 0 is 0, times 3 is 0, so this would be undefined. So the, the derivative, f prime of 1, does not exist. So there's our critical point. All right, secondly, we have x equals 0 and x equals 5. Those are our endpoints, so we want to test them now. So again, I'm going to go in order. So f of 0 is 0 minus 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. That's negative 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. Well, this is the cube root of negative 1, which is negative 1, squared, which is 1, so that's 1 plus 2, and that equals 3. All right, now, f of 
1. Now notice, I already know that f prime is of 1 does not exist, but I'm putting 1 back into f, not back into f prime. All right, because I want to know the maximum val and minimum values, the extreme values for f. The, the derivative is just a way to identify the critical points. All right, so I put this back into my function, and I end up with 1 minus 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. Well, that's 0. You know, the 0 to the 2 thirds is 0 plus 2, so that's 2. And then finally, let's put in 5. So I have 5 minus, whoops getting ahead of myself there, 5 minus 1, which is 4. So 5 minus 1 to the 2 thirds plus 2. So that's 4 to the 2 thirds plus 2. So um, if I square this and take the cube root, well, maybe that's not what I wanted. I wanted something that turned out to be an integer. But the point is, let's see, 16, the cube root of 16. This is, the bottom line here is this is definitely going to be greater than 3. Um, I wanted to pick something that, that worked out nicely, um, but that one doesn't seem to do it. So um, we, could, we could estimate this to be about 3, which would give us something along the lines of 5. Um, so you could verify this with your, with your calculator. So let's, if we call this about 5, then this one is our max. And 2 is the smallest of these three values, so here is our minimum. And if we were to look at this, you know, if this is, does indeed happen at 1, and then we go out to 5, um, so we're here, and then at 0, we're here. So it does make sense. The maximum occurs out here. Here's the minimum, and, and that's just the other endpoint. All right, so that's just an example of the general idea. We want to find our critical points or our critical values, uh, and then we want to check the endpoints. Um, so this is how we use the derivative to find the extreme values of a continuous function on a closed interval.